Hello everyone and welcome to PC RetroTech. So in this week's video I want to show you a new CGA graphics demo I've been working on for my 8088 machine. Uh, but before I do that I want to show you some older demos that I found online. I did a bit of digital archaeology and I managed to turn up some demos from the 90s that will actually run on this hardware. Now of course there are some other more recent and well-known demos which everyone is familiar with. The most famous of which, of course, is the 8088 MPH demo by Hornet, CRTC and Desire. And this is for the original IBM PC at 4.77 MHz uh, with a CGA graphics card, uh, but they get thousands of colors by using the composite output of the CGA card and some tricks with the NTSC standard. And uh, this particular demo has a soundtrack, 3D animation, uh, it's really an incredible a piece of work, but of course it's many man years of effort from quite a number of people. The second one of course is 8088 Corruption, which is a demo by Trickster of Hornet and a collaborator, and it's basically full motion video on an original IBM 8088, and of course they're using text mode here uh, to give uh, the appearance of graphics, uh, but it's still incredibly impressive, especially given that this was written in 2006. So in 2014 there was a later version of this uh, called 8088 Domination and of course this uses graphics mode instead of text mode. Uh, the guy said that it took him seven years to realize this was even possible. Uh, but this is on an IBM 5160 which is uh, only just later than the 5150. In terms of specs it's basically identical. Uh, so those are the most famous demos, and I'm sure everyone has seen them. If you haven't, you, wow, you've really missed out on something exciting, so go look those up. So I began to wonder whether that's it, whether those three demos are basically all that was ever written for this platform. Uh, but I did a bit of digging around on the internet, and I eventually found on Hornet's website uh, the 8086 Compo, which was a competition in 1995. Uh, for 8086 machines with either a CGA or EGA graphics card. And a few things were happening in the scene at that time. There were certainly OpenGL cards available and a lot of demos were sort of becoming object shows as they're described here uh, where you just mock up some 3D models and just show them one after the other and this was far easier than learning how to do really fast to the metal coding as it's described here. Uh, that was required if all you had was older hardware. So in the end there are only three entries into this. Uh, they're called 4.77 MHz, VGA less and 8086 feet under. And there was a fourth uh, program here called fast.com which is just written by one of the judges, Shadow Lord, uh, who made the 8086 feet under demo run twice as fast. Uh, so this was a pretty uh, disappointing effort, really, in a sense, that only three people in the entire demo scene were interested in doing this. And it does show you uh, just how difficult and unpopular uh, writing for these sorts of machines is. And I should point out that uh, the machine that was used here was a Tandy, which really does allow 16-color uh, CGA. And, of course, they also had some fairly good sound cards, uh, so there was a ta the Tandy sound, of course, and also an ad lib card. Uh, so I'm going to show the graphics from these demos. I'm going to leave the sound off, uh, basically because I don't have either a Tandy machine or an ad lib. Uh, but I, at least we can appreciate the graphics from these entries. So the first one I'm going to run is the 4.77 MHz demo, and uh, it's by Philip Hassey and it really wants either a Tandy or Adlib sound device uh, but I have neither. Uh, but one interesting thing about this demo is that it actually allows you to use both and it will use one of the sound devices for one channel and the other for the other channel. Uh, so I'm going to select none and I should also say that I'm using a 386 here uh, because uh, I don't have a Tandy so I can't show you the Tandy graphics and the other option is VGA which just basically simulates having a Tandy which is exactly what you want. Uh, it does a little bit of pre-computation at the beginning. It's quite slow. Uh, even though it's running on a 386, I am running it with turbo off here, so it's running at 8 megahertz. Uh, so it's not too far off what you would expect to see uh, from machines of the era. 
Now all the real demo effects seem to be at the very beginning of the demo here and uh, they're very basic and quite slow um, but uh, at least you can see um, a few tricks that were done graphically uh, for machines of this era albeit with 16 colors. Uh, from here on in uh, the demo basically is just an image show and uh, they very cleverly took uh, pictures from games from the era that the 8088 was around and they just go through those one after the other and so it's really clear that this particular demo was more focused on the sound than on the graphics uh, apart from those few little demo effects at the beginning everything else is just uh, pictures being shown uh, but it does give you a little bit of an idea of uh, at least what the graphics in games look like in this era all in one hit and then at the very end here there's a, you know a sort of a custom graphic to finish everything off which looks pretty impressive uh, so that's the 4.77 megahertz demo so the next one is the VGA less demo and I'm just showing a very short segment of it here running on an actual CGI card uh, and it's really not very pretty and the reason for that is because it was actually designed to run with composite output so I'm going to switch over now to using actual composite uh, monitor uh, so we can see what this was supposed to look like. So as you can see the VGA less demo gives you an option of 256 color CGA which I'm going to choose here. Uh, it's a little bit of flickering but eventually it starts. Uh, now the beginning of this demo has uh, quite a few seconds of pre-computation. I'm actually running this on an original IBM PC at 4.77 megahertz. Uh, which would have been a little bit slower than the competition machine uh, and eventually it starts. Now I'm not sure whether the colors are exactly right here um, I'm using a PAL to N uh, NTSC converter uh, because I want to use a PAL monitor here but of course the output of the CJ card is NTSC so if you want to see how to do that uh, I have a video on my channel about that uh, 16 colors on a CGA adapter with European monitor. Uh, so it starts off the demo with a kind of fire effect and uh, this is actually something that I want to do a little bit later today uh, is a fire effect on the CGA card on the same machine essentially. Uh, we're going to run a slightly smaller fire effect uh, than is running here uh, but it will be also be a little faster now much of this demo is the same thing uh, for long periods of time so I'm going to skip ahead to each different scene as it evolves. So in this scene there's a ring that sort of rotates around in real time uh, and also changes size so this sort of thing is actually really hard to do on this hardware and it's, it's fairly impressive what they're pulling off in real time here uh, because if you want to do any kind of rotation uh, if first of all a lot of sines and cosines to compute and secondly you've got the slowness of the CGA system itself. Uh, so this seems to be something like a, a matrix screensaver like effect. Uh, it's a little bit flickery and very slow. I'm not sure why this one has to be quite so slow. Uh, and then it goes back to rotating the ring over the top of that. So in this part of the demo there's just a ring as we had before but there's a smaller one in the middle of that and then a few other uh, things around the outside. Now as you can see it's a little bit artifacty uh, in this particular demo and it seems that uh, whatever algorithm was used to generate the data uh, didn't do everything exactly and so it would leave pixels behind. Uh, but once again, you know, I have to emphasize that doing anything, um, you know, at this scale uh, and this size, especially with uh, many colors as they have here, is really tricky uh, on this hardware. So it's not terribly surprising that there are some issues uh, when they try to do it at speed. Uh, so anyway, this uh, seems to be the end of the demo. Um, there's a nice graphic at the end of it, although as you can see, the... Um, colors don't look quite right. Everything looks like a kind of checkerboard pattern here which I, I wouldn't really expect um, but you know nevertheless uh, this is what comes out on my monitor at least. Uh, I'd be interested if someone has better hardware 
uh, that can show this, uh, say American hardware, and would like to put a video up, I'd be very interested in seeing that on YouTube. Now this is the 8086 feet under demo, and it's actually not running on an IBM PC here. I was just unable to get it to work with my CGA card. Uh, so instead I'm running it on the 386 with a VGA card. Uh, now they boast here that it should run at 9 frames a second on a 4.77 megahertz IBM PC with a CGA card. Uh, and so I guess on an 8086 at 8 megahertz it must have run at 15 or 20 frames a second. Uh, I'm getting a little over three times that here on the 386, and that's probably mainly due to the VGA card being a lot faster. Uh, now this is a demo effect called a rotor zoom, so it rotates and zooms an image, and it's a very standard fare for uh, demos of the era. Uh, and I'm actually really impressed with the speed of this. Uh, this is insanely fast, uh, even if we go back to uh, you know 15 or 20 frames a second that's still incredibly impressive and the reason is that to update that many pixels on the screen uh, is just really really expensive um, at first I thought this was probably using a text mode uh, those could just be small blocky characters um, instead of actual pixels being updated but there are a couple of reasons why I think this is not the case uh, the first is that scrolling text at the bottom doesn't look like it's done in a text mode at all and uh, the second reason is that uh, it would run just fine on a standard CGA graphics card if it was text. Uh, so I'm really not sure why um, it doesn't run on the CGA card I have. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I think that it really has to be a graphics mode demo. And that makes it especially impressive in my opinion. It's surprising actually that it only came third in the competition. Uh, but of course uh, there's only this single uh, demo effect and as you saw uh, one of the judges managed to make this run twice as fast so let's get to the demo effects that I've been working on and uh, before I get to the new ones uh, I want to revisit this one which uh, I called the elliptic worm and it's basically a series of ellipses going around the edge of the screen uh, this is roughly how it looked uh, with the turbo on last time. Uh, the only difference this time is that turbo is actually off at the moment. So in other words, it's been sped up by about 50%. So let me show you it with turbo switched on. And so there it is. As you can see, it's flashing around the screen now in about half a second. And of course, I didn't come up with a new way to draw ellipses and speed it up that way. I think we were pretty much already at the limit there. Uh, instead, what I've done is do some pre-computation of some very specific information. So, when you draw an ellipse, uh, an ellipse is either almost entirely moving vertically or almost entirely moving horizontally, depending on which part of the ellipse you're drawing. And so, let's say you're moving vertically, the only decision that needs to be made uh, as you increment the, the y direction is whether or not you should also move one space in the x direction. So that decision is what we're actually computing when we're computing the coordinates of the ellipse. Uh, but instead of actually doing that computation, what I'm now doing is storing one bit of information for every such decision. So if the uh, ellipse should move one pixel to the right, uh, then I store a one, and if it shouldn't, then I store a zero. And so actually you can, you can really do pre-computation for an entire ellipse in just 10 bytes, which is really incredible. Uh, now you can still draw the ellipses anywhere you want on the screen in any color. It's just really the computation that you're saving. Uh, so this is really a massive improvement. In fact, it's so fast now, it's a little bit too quick. So what we can do actually is use that extra power that we now have to draw more ellipses. And so here we have it moving just three pixels between each ellipse instead of ten. Uh, so there's over three times as many ellipses being drawn here and it still feels really quite zippy. Uh, so basically pre-computation gives you a lot of extra flexibility. Uh, now you might think that you could just compute the dots uh, or the coordinates for the uh, pixels in the ellipses uh, instead of doing what I'm doing and computing the branches. And the answer is that you can't really do that because drawing dots individually uh, is very, very slow. Uh, we really take advantage that, of the fact that each dot is uh, related to the one before it. 
it's either one pixel above or below or to the left or to the right and so on and we also take advantage of the fact that especially when we're drawing the horizontal direction we can draw multiple dots at once uh, to save access to the screen memory uh, so this is really about as fast as you're going to get this to go as far as I can see anyway if anyone has any brilliant ideas uh, let me know or implement them and show them off uh, but now that we've got such fast ellipse code uh, let's try another effect so this is the effect that I came up with and it's a pretty common effect in demos uh, it's a series of concentric circles that are getting bigger unfortunately it's running t twice as slow as I'd like and the reason for that is that I can't just simply draw circles that are getting bigger by one pixel uh, at a time. Uh, so what I have to do instead is draw ellipses that first get bigger in the x direction then in the y direction. If I don't do that then some pixels get skipped uh, as the circles get bigger and so you end up with these black dots uh, all over the diagram which just look ugly. Now if I was really committed to this and wanted to make it run as fast as possible I'd fill all those black dots in by hand so I could get the full speed out of this. Uh, but I'm just doing a demonstration here of what's possible uh, with this code so I'm not going to do that um, at the moment. Uh, so the next effect that I worked on, uh, actually the one that I spent the most time on, uh, is another very standard demo effect but it's a more natural effect this time uh, instead of you know geometric shapes. Uh, it's a fire effect. As you can see, it's not too terrible for a first attempt. Uh, it is going quite fast and uh, it goes the full width of the screen. Uh, the main problem, other than the ugly CJ colouring, is that it doesn't go up the screen very far. And this is due to the algorithm that I use. So I am just averaging the point below, the one below and to the left, and below and to the right. And then decreasing the value as I go up. Uh, but the problem with this is I only have four colors to deal with. So first of all, I have to use pairs of pixels to give me more values. Uh, so each pair of pixels has a total of 16 different possible values. Uh, and that only gives me a possibility to decrease the value by one each time, uh, giving me at most 16 lines that I can go up the screen. Uh, now I can get around this, of course, by uh, doing the computations in a different array and just pretending that uh, there are more colors. Uh, so for example, I could start with 32 colors and once I've done the computation, then map it down to the 16 different possible values for each pair of pixels on the screen. Uh, so it's not too bad the way it's worked out. Uh, obviously, when the values get really low, one of the pixels will become black, and so you only end up with every second pixel lit uh, when the values are low. So that looks quite reasonable, but we really want it to go further up on the screen. So let's see what that looks like. So in this second version of the effect, it comes about twice as far up the screen, but it's still running around the same speed. And the speed up was possible because I no longer do any reading from screen memory, but try and do as much as possible in main memory. I also noticed that for most of the lines, no overflow can occur in the arithmetic, so I was able to write a special version that doesn't have to handle that. But there's still some problems. So at the top of the effect, it's one pixel short of the left of the screen. And in fact, every second vertical line is black. Also at the bottom, everything looks too random. So let's try and fix some of those in a third version. So in this third version of the effect, I've managed to fix some of the problems. Uh, the ones at the top I fix by shifting every second line to the left by one pixel. And this is very cheap to do because it just means shifting each byte by two bits. Uh, the randomness at the bottom was gotten rid of by oring each pixel with its immediate neighbor. So that makes them more likely to be the same. And so it doesn't look quite so busy down the bottom anymore. Uh, unfortunately, the combination of these two fixes introduced some vertical bars in the middle of the the effect and so what I had to do to get rid of those is change the source of randomness that I'm using uh, where everything starts off at the bottom of the picture and by making those values more similar uh, there are more pixels reaching the middle of the effect with higher values and that got rid of the weird vertical bars uh, but unfortunately it's meant that there's now a sea of blue at the bottom and uh, so the whole thing really now looks more like a bubbling cauldron than a fire. 
Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that the whole thing is very flat. Uh, there's no sort of peaks in uh, any of the flames. And uh, I think if I did this again, I would certainly do it the way Doom did, where each pixel only depends on the value of one of the pixels below it, uh, rather than averaging three. Uh, but anyway, I think this is all right for, uh, you know, a fire effect using CJ. I think the biggest limitation here is actually the coloring. Uh, in fact, what I might do next is try one of the other CGI color palettes and see if that makes a difference to the effect. So this is what it looks like with the so-called warm CGI palette. And I'm not sure that it looks any more like a fire. I don't think fires are more likely to be green than they are blue. Uh, but perhaps it looks a little better. Uh, one of the other things that could be done here to improve things, of course, would be to choose the colors more wisely. At the moment, what I'm doing is I'm taking the 32 values that are computed in main memory and I'm just dividing by 2 to get a value between 0 and 16 for each pair of pixels. Uh, now, of course, I could, instead of doing that, use a lookup table to look up what pair of pixels I should pick. And that would actually enable me to get rid of that blocky green uh, that I'm seeing. Uh, now, that would of course be more expensive and uh, that's going to slow things down. Bear in mind that at the moment we're only filling about an eighth of the screen with information here and we're not doing anything else on the rest of the screen and yet we're using all of the CPU power. Uh, so of course you could scroll some text across the screen and make some boasts about how many frames a second this is but you don't really have a lot of power left to do anything else uh, that's interesting. And so that's one of the considerations in making this effect more complicated. You may be able to make uh, this look better, but at the expense of performance. Uh, anyway, in a later video, I think I'm going to try a rotor zoom, uh, which is one of the effects we saw in one of the demos from 1995. Um, so if you're interested in that and haven't subscribed, then please do. Um, I think that will be very interesting to see if we can match the 9 frames a second that they were boasting there. Um, anyway, that's all I really have for today. Uh, it's been really great fun writing this, and uh, so hopefully you enjoyed watching it as well. Uh, thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you in a later video. Bye!